Good morning. So let's talk about exam four, lecture four, which is host microbial interaction and the basic immunology. Uh, these slides, please read very carefully. It's going to be lots of questions in the final exam because I think this, these slides are very important. And also look at the YouTube video when I talk about acquired immune system development. Uh, that will be a supplement of these slides. So first of all, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about host microbial interactions. So our body has been has been harbors, which means contain lots of bacteria. How much more they compare to the human cells? It 10 times more. And I want to tell you one thing. Those natural microorganisms, or we say bacteria in our body, is very important. We need to keep the balance between host defense and those microorganisms because they are composed by the basic immune system in our body. Okay, so the host resistance, which is including the surface defense, phagocytosis, which is related to the phagosome, macrophage, and the immunity. We are talking about the B cell, T cell, which is a humoral immune and the cell mediated immune. And then the microbial virulence, including the colonization, the ability to resist host cells, invasive, and the ability to damage host cell. So always remember, our body, which is not have a disease, stay healthy, is always a balance between host defense and the microbial virulence. We cannot avoid the microbial virulence because they are widely existing. And why we keep stay healthy? Because we have that resistance system or we can call it defense system, which is including physical, chemical, and the immunology defense system. So we will talk about these a little bit detail in this section. <laughs> so this is what happened if our body exposed to microorganism. So first of all, what happened is colonization, which means microorganisms started to colonize on the body. They stay there. Some of them will be multiplication, which means they grow there. Some of them, they will be died. So we'll talk about these one by one. So after colonization, some of the microorganisms will be directly eliminated by host defense system. All we call it a transition step. Those bacteria will be gone immediately. <laughs> but unfortunately, that's not happened all the time. Most of the time will cause infection, which means the microorganisms go into the body, they stay there, they cause type of the inflammation actually at the beginning. Now, depends on what happened. There is different pathway for the further development of the infection. Some of the microorganisms, they may become normal bacteria in our intestinal area. Some of them, they will become pathogenicity effect, develop to infectious disease. And how severe it is, it depends on microbial virulence and also the competition between the host resistant defense system. Now, we all know that there is some of the infectious di disease, they are looks like nothing happened. So we call it no disease symptoms. No disease symptoms later on could be carry on, become carrier status, which means no apparent symptoms, but the microbial is shared, which means microbial is there. And that could be acute, chronic and latent. Or those no disease symptoms status will be eliminated, depends on whether the human being or animal has a strong immune system. <laughs> So this is the development. And remember, when we talk about the streptococcemonia, we mention about bacteriocemia and the septicemia. What's the difference between that? Bacteriocemia is bacteria only colonization in the bloodstream, in the blood cell. But septicemia, they will start to cause infection and there will be multiplication. And the infection will be developed into different stages. So that's overall tells you about the expose 
micro to microorganisms, what happened for the human being. So host resistant overview, uh, we're gonna talk about these is most of the pathogens they are causing the disease caused by my microbes. They will be overcome surface barrier and the rich underlying. Surface barrier use, usually is those physical barrier. And then later on, they will overcome resistance by the host cell. That could be non specific resistance. We call it universal defense system, or it could be specific immune response, which means related to the B cell and T cell. So let's talk about some of the terminology. So, first of all, what is called the immune system? It is composed of widely distributed cells, tissues, and organs. Any of the foreign substance we recognize as an antigen, actually, then and the, and the microorganisms, and we try to neutralize and to destroy them. Second, what is called the immunity? That is the ability of the host to resist a particular disease or infection. Then what is immunology? Of course, the science behind that behind the immune response. Now, for the regarding the immunity, there is two types of the immune response. Number one is non-specific immune response, which means more universal. Number two is specific immune response. What means non-specific immune response? They are not specific resistant. For example, natural microbial organism in our body, that's a natural immunity. That's a first line of defense. And they offer us resistance to any microorganism or foreign material, but they do not have a strong or do not have any immunology memory ability. It's very universal. So give you an example, white blood cell have defense system, have a macrophage, we gotta mention. Anything happened at the beginning, the macrophage will start to work but may not be effective. And they do not have a immune memory, which means the second time you happened, it's gonna do the same thing and not gonna be remembered. Specific immune response could be acquired, adaptive or specific immune. Remember, we talk about four different types of the immune response, uh, which is natural, acquired passive immune, natural acquired active immune, and artificial acquired active immune, artificial acquired passive immune. Uh, I draw those on the blackboard at on the YouTube, so you kind of have to look at that. They resistant to a particular foreign agent. They has a usually a strong memory ability and the effective increase when you repeat the exposure to the agent. So these are easy to understand. Now we want to talk about these a little bit. First of all, is surface defense. This is most of them are physical, chemical, de chemical defense. So mechanical, our skin, mucus, cilia, coughing, and the flushing will have an effect. So skin, remember, we more or less have some salt on the skin. Lots of the bacteria don't like salt unless it's halophiles. So the salt components in the skin is a defense system. But unfortunately, it doesn't work very well. Remember, Staphylococcus aureus can survive on the skin surface very well. Second is the mucus. Mucus in the intestinal area or in the lung area, usually it's very, very important because they can be uh, trapped, entrapped microorganism. And then they can help the microphage become a phagosome and then generate a lysozyme and the lactoferrin, all those antimicrobial substance to curing bacteria. Now, thylia is the same thing. Thylia will be containing some of the antimicrobials such as lysozyme, uh, lactoferrin, and the, some of the acids, they could be uh, entrapped bacteria in the lung area and also and later on generate the sputum sample and then they're taking out of the body. Uh, but be careful, uh, mucus and the cilia are not always helpful, especially as they relate to the ATP, if they synthesize become CAM, AD, sorry, AMP synthesize become CAMP, then lots of the mucus will happen. 
and they are not good. For example, both terrible pertussis cause whooping cough, which is too heavy mucus in the cilia in the lung area. So that's why you cause whooping cough. So they do have a defense impact, but not that strong. Now coughing is one of the way to take out of the microorganism from the body. The last one is flushing. Remember, taking out of the urine sample is a good way to prevent microorganisms. So I said in the lab section, please do not hold on the pee too long. Otherwise, microorganisms from the, in, from the kidney area or intestinal area could be re, could, could be retranslocated retranslo into the urinary tract. And I also mentioned it happens, which is female have a short uh, urethral tract. That's why it's easy to get UTI urinary tract infection compared to the male who has a relatively longer urinary tract. Now from the chemical, low pH environments in the stomach, for example, the acid is always killing bacteria. And the lysozyme, bile, acids, those are chemicals. Now, always remember microorganism is important, most important components in our body. That's a surface defense system. Our microenvironment in our body is very important. There is a science called uh, intestinal microflora using 60S RNA to testing the dynamic balance of the natural microorganism in our body, which is important. That's another reason why antibiotics is, needs to be well controlled, the dose determined by MIC, minimum inhibitory concentration, because if the normal flora has been cured or inhibited, it may infect lots of the body function. Now, phagocytic defense, which is talk about a white blood cell containing lysozyme. We'll have another slide to talk about. Now, immunity, we talk about a real immune, which is a humoral immune, and the cell mediated immune, which is B cell and T cell. Now, this is a non specific surface defense system, which is give you a figure to talk about that. Now, conjunctiva in our eye do have lots of chemicals for surface defense. Now, there is a joke. And not really a joke, it's really a survey results which is showing uh, girls or female has a longer lifetime compared to male because they're always crying. Well, it sounds like a joke, but they do tell us the tears has lots of chemicals, typically is lysozyme, could be killing bacteria. So that helps for stay healthy. Second, I just mentioned the respiratory mucus, mucus area, they could entrap the bacteria, help lysozyme, lactoferrin to repel that. Now, normal intestinal microflora, that's a huge topic right now. And uh, genitourinary mucus, flushing action of the urine, that's also to help your body, we just mentioned. And the oral mucus, we have a uh, salivia, Lysozyme, normal microflora, that's important. Alimentary tract mucus, that helps. But the more important in the stomach area is the low pH. Remember I said in the lab section, the stomach area pH is one to two. It is very effective to curing all microorganisms. Only acid resistant bacteria can grow, but one exception is Helicobacteria parallel, which is HP. That's related to stomach cancer. Now on the skin surface, we have a tons of material can help prevent the bacterial infection, including fatty acids, normal flora, lysozyme in sweet, and also the salt concentration. So this is gives the overall of the non-specific surface defense system. Now, this is a normal human microbiota in the body. You can see from the nasal area, mouth, skin, vagina, urethra, throat, stomach, small intestinal, large intestinal, there are so many microorganisms. They'll keep the balance. And I we mentioned that all these staphylococcus aureus, streptococcus ammonia, hemophilus as a corner bacteria, those actually, lots of them are normal bacteria in our oral cavity. 
But when the condition changes, they could be translocated and they cause problems. Those are why we call it opportunistic microorganism. They are looking for opportunity to cause problems. Now, mouse area, remember we talk about veridime streptococcus, but there's also other things. Skin surfaces, number one, staphylococcus, and the, and the micrococcus. And the vagina area, what I said in the lab section, it's usually it's low pH because the lactobacillus is dominant there. So it's a very good protection. But sometimes if the water is gone or you using a tampon in the period of time, in women period of time, absorb all the water, what happens? Those bacteria are gonna die. Then staphylococcus aureus will be dominant because further will develop to toxic shock symptoms. That's what we mentioned. Urethral, streptococcus microbacteria is dominant there. Throat culture, that's a reason lots of you, the tonsil is taking out because throat area is colonizing lots of the bacteria. Okay, we used to have a lab section to test the throat culture. Number one, streptococcus, number one, staphylococcus. You may also find the colony bacteria. Stomach area, usually low pH, not many bacteria. Helicobacter pylori, that's one what I mentioned, HP, could be survived there. How they survived, do you still remember ureas? They could be break down urea, become ammonia and carbon dioxide, that um, ammonia will be buffering the low pH of the, of the stomach area. Now, small intestinal area does not have lots of bacteria. Some of the East Candida and Albicans could be there, but the large intestinal area, tons of bacteria, more than 10 to the 12. So there is a microbiota study using 68 RNA can do the testing of that if you get a stool sample. Lots of research done in that area. So just to let you know, our human being has 10 times my human microorganism compared to our human tissue cells. And those are very important the first self-defense system for in our human body, combined with white blood cell and other physical and chemical defense system. Okay, this is what we talk about is the original of blood cell. Okay, so we want to talk about these very important material. They all come from a stem cell, then become myroids and the lymphonoid. So remember, we talk about red blood cell. What are they? What are they called? Aerocyte, aerocyte. That's red blood cell. Red blood cell is important because it carrying oxygen, new, new nutrients in our blood cell. Platelets or platelets, what are they? Very important for prevent the clotting of our blood cell. Okay, if you have, if you don't have that, it's gonna cause clotting. So prevent the clotting of a blood cell. Now macrophage. Macrophage is very important. They're coming from monocyte. They can be penetrated, widely existing or in all our tissue human tissue and organs. And they can do a very widely universal defense system, become a phagosome, and then activate lysozyme. Then to break down the bacterial cell, cell wall structure, the connection between NAG and NAM, which is nicotinic adenine, uh, which is n muramic acids and n Glucosiami and the usual they break down the one to four bound system, beta bound, beta one to one prime to four prime bonding system. Okay, that's macrophage, which is kind of the, belonging to the white blood cell. Now we have another group of white blood cell, which is granulites, including neutrophils, uh, eosinophils, and the basophiles. Neutrophils, most of the time, which is will accompany generate histamine. So they will be have a, a anti allergic reaction, which is usually triggered by the neutrophils. Now, SNFL, this is usually talking about is anti protozoan And for antibacteria, most of the time is basophil. 
Here we're going to talk about later on. We already talked about in the video, which is B cell and T cell. Now, where it comes from the B cell? That's come from a chicken, Bursa fabricus, which is a muscle surrounding the chicken asthma. And when I, when I talk about the joke, so you can remember it. So that's called the B cell. And T cell, it's a universal defense system, another universal defense system. So we call it a cell mediated immune. We usually call it a phoneme, could be, could be called a T cell mediated immune. Now, this is what we talk about is macrophage, what they're going to happen. Okay, this is a macrophage. So the bacteria come in, they generate a called acetylpodium. And then the membrane fusion become a phagosome. And the phagosome, usually it's a low pH trigger, attracted the lysozyme. Then the lysozyme could cause lysis because lysozyme will break down. I just mentioned the beta one prime, four prime bonds between N muramic acids and M grocyame. Uh, Those two are the major components and the modified sugar of peptidine glycan. And peptidine glycan is major components of cell wall. If you still remember if, the material in the examination one, they can lysis a bacterial cell. That's the whole process triggered by the macrophage called the phagocytosis. It's a very universal defense system in the body. Now, in our bodies, there is widely existing some of the organs which is re related to immune. Let's say thymus, lymph nodes, bone marrow, and the, and the these are tells you the structure is there. And the, I'm gonna skip that. And then because we already drawn the picture on the on the YouTube channel, you can watch that. Now, types of the specific immune, what are types of the specific immune? Remember, we have uh, uh, two lines. They are coming from the stem cell. And we have a B cell called humoral immune. They will generate antibody and the strong memory B cell. OK, and T cell line, they generate the T cell. They have T, T killer cell, T help cell, natural T cell. They also have a little bit of memory ability. But what's the major difference? T cell line will not generate antibody. That's a major difference. At the B cell, we call it a humoral immune, and T cell line, we call it a cell mediated immune. Okay, now we're going to talk about some of the immune system defense. First of all, what is called the antigen? That is, we call it a foreign usually. It's a substance stimulates the immune response in the human body. Now, I want to mention one thing very important. From the bacteria standpoint, a whole bacteria, we don't call it an antigen. We call antigen is a specific parts of a microorganism or bacteria. For example, proteins, for example, polysaccharides, nucleic acids. Okay. Now, regarding the antigens, usually you, they recognize as a foreigner. And uh, how strong they can stimulate the immune response, the larger molecule is the better. Now, the antigens, they always have a places, which is a small site on the antigen to determine what kind of the immune response will happen. That's terminology called the eptode. This is the one we talk about is the antigen of a bacterial cell. We just gave you some of the example, okay? First of all, remember we talk about E. coli 0157H7. Do you remember when, when I drawn the blackboard? And I said, I'm gonna tell you what is OH means. So E. coli 0157H7, what is O means? O is the antigen. It's a lipopolysaccharide side chain we call it somatic, modify the sugar. What is H antigen? H antigen represents flagella. So E. coli 0157H7 is a combination of O antigen and H antigen gives them a serological typing 157 and 7. It is like from the serological standpoint, gave E. coli an ID, like give you a personal ID, give bacterial ID, they can be recognized. Okay, so that's why the 0157H7 comes from. 
Now remember, streptococcus pyogenes have the M antigen, and the streptococcus ammonia do not have the M antigen, so they do not belong into any of the Rebecca Lansfield group. Okay. Some other things, plasma membrane could be antigen, ribosome is antigen, K, sometimes we call E. coli K88, where the K means it's a capsule. So here, which is tells you the structure, specific structure is an antigen. The whole cell is not an antigen. This is what we call, talk about uh, in the video already. This is the structure of an immune grouping. What is another name for the immune grouping? Of course, it's antibody. So they have two, line, two lines, heavy line and the light line. Okay, heavy line, it's a molecular weight, 40,000, composed about 400 amino acids. Light, li light line, composed by 25,000 uh, 25, DA and uh, composed by 250 amino acids. They connected each other with the dull sulfide bonds and the angle, we call it a hinge, it's somewhere between 90 to 180 degree. And a very important on the top of here called the variable region because they could be attached by the antigen. But how about the tail here? That's related to the antibody antigen reaction cause called opsonization, okay? This is what we talk about how the antibody and the antigens it can be reacted. Basically five different reactions. Number one, precipitation, very simple. Cause precipitate, solid at the bottom of the tubes. Second one, neutralization, what that means, antitoxin. Okay, agglutination, we mentioned about agglutination, very similar to precipitation, but what's the difference? Zero is a cross-link clumping generate between antibody and antigen. Then we talk about the opsonization. Why opsonization is important? Because they are attracted by macrophage. How, how the macrophage could come from? They are attacking to the FC structure of the H line of the antibody. Then the macrophage could generate what? We go back to see right here. This is what happens. The macrophage comes, they will have a Phagosome, triggered by lysosome, then lysis bacteria cell. So these are the things which is connected. So you have to be, go back to look at the slides and you understanding it. Last one, complement fixing. So what is complement? That's a series of the immune activated protein in our bloodstream. And they will be helping attached by antibody antigen complex, then lysis cell. Okay, so that's called a complement fixing. Okay, so we talk about the antibody antigen reaction. Now we're gonna talk about the vaccination. Now these days we talk about this very often because of the coronavirus. So first of all, what is vaccination? Do you still remember the first day of the class we talk about VACCI? Means a car, Edward Jenny injected uh, some of the extraction from the, um, uh, from the cow and then go into, actually is a, we call it a cow, um, we, we, we call it a cow mucus system coming from um, a, a woman from the dairy farms, from the leading areas and go to the kids. The kids is survived. So that's a vaccination. That's what we call it's vaccination. They induce immunology membrane for a specific passenger. Their specific response for antibody antigen reaction. Now, I want to mention this the vaccination is an artificial active immune, which is actually artificial active, which, which is artificial acquired active immune, is a vaccination. Now, when we get a disease, let's say we get a cold virus and you recovered. That is called a natural active immune, okay? And we mentioned about what is called a natural passive immune. You get from the placenta, from the pregnant woman to the newborn. Now, what is called the artificial passive immune? A good example is anti-equine, botulism, 
toxin. Is that right? When you have a clostridium botulism or clostridium tetany, where you get it, how you do the treatment, especially clostridium tetany, you get it from the equine, which is anti-equine anti um, blood. So you inject into human being. That is called artificial passive immune. So I'll give you an example for the coronavirus. We are developing some of the therapeutic treatments, which is get the patients from coronavirus. We get a blood cell. We give them the blood sample. Then we, we uh, purified it. Then we inject it into the human being, the patient who has it, a new patient. That is called artificial passive immune. But when we have a developer vaccine, if we have, that's called artificial active immune. Now, what kind of the vaccine we will have? They are basically five different types of, okay? Number one is cured microbials. Example, polio and the whooping cough. Cured microbials, usually it's a microorganism has been cured. So they are effective, but not really very strong because uh, the bacteria has been cured. Now, the most important and the most effective vaccine, which is actually is called attenuated vaccine. A good example is Sabine polio vaccine and MMR, mumps, measles, and rubella. Everybody needs to have a shot. One shot, three jobs, MMR. What that attenuated means, which means it's actually a live, live microorganism. But we attenuated it become a lower dose, they still survive. And then you inject it into the body, they will stimulate uh, antigen antibody reaction. Oh, okay, so they mimic an immune response in the body. They are most effective, usually one shot in your lifetime. Now the third category is purified antigens. That is usually is we are taking parts of the microorganism to create an antigen. For example, capsule, for example, uh, polycytes, uh, for example, peptidine glycan. So meningitis, whooping cough, or those, including ammonia, usually it's, come, it's a purified antigens. That means parts of the virus or microorganism we purified. The, the fourth group, which is called toxoids, good example is DTAP, diphtheria, tetanus, and uh, pertussis. Toxoids is a chemical, is a toxic-like chemical. So toxoids only activate T cell. They're not gonna activate the B cell. So they do have a immune, uh, immune system activated, but not very strong. So you need a lots of booster, which means the lady, uh, which means newborn babies after two months, four months, six months, one year, two years, they have to have a booster for the DTAP. The last one, genetically engineered hepatitis is an example of the vaccine. Those vaccines are usually expensive. Now, right now, the coronavirus vaccine, we're using mRNA, that's also genetically en engineered. Now, this is the one, is uh, required in the United States from newborn to adolescent, you need to follow this schedule, okay? So vaccination of children usually begun like two months. So look at diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, DTAP, two months, four months, six months, 15, 18 months, and four to six year old, because that's a toxoid. It's a toxic like chemicals, only activity T cell line. That's why you have to do different shots. HIV, you need to do several, PCV, the same thing. Okay, MMR, actually only one. Okay, so because MMR is a live cell, attenuated vaccine. So just let you know. Why you have needed so many boots, boosters, so many shots? Because it doesn't have a very, really strong memory ability. It's only activated T cell line, not really for B cell line. And I tell you one thing, very few vaccines can really activate the B cell line unless they're live cell, live microorganism cell created the microorganism. So let's MMR. Now, my opinion for the coronavirus vaccine, we're pretty much sure 
it's only activated T cell line. And it's gonna be need boosters, pretty much need boosters uh, later on. And uh, I also wanna mention, there is some recommend recommendation by the CDC. They said, uh, in this flu season, please take a flu shot. It's also gonna protect you from coronavirus possibly. The reason is if when you have a flu shots, it's gonna be activate your T cell line. Then we'll be let your body have T killer, killer cell, T help cell, and the T natural T cell. All those will be helping to prevent the coronavirus infection, but it's a universal protection, not really specific. Okay, so that's why they still recommend you to have a flu shot. Okay, now using the immune response system, we could actually at the end of the day is developing an antibody. Now, something I wanna mention very important. When we talk of vaccination, you should always remember, typically for a virus caused the infectious disease, vaccine, vaccination is the only effective way to treat it. And the therapeutic other drugs, not very effective. I will let you know when we talk about the virus. The vaccination is the number one to treat virus disease. And the, the second method, what we could do is create an antibody or extract the antibody from a patient. Let's say they're the coronavirus patient, we can create it to extract the antibody, anti-coronavirus antibody from a serum sample from a patient, then to inject it into a new patient. But the process is difficult and it's very expensive to do. So I'm gonna to explain to you a little bit of some of the example. So first of all, you need to know where is gonna be the antibody really prolific and widely existing is in the serian area. What is a serian? When you have a blood stream sample, blood, blood liquid, you go to the centrifuge. It will be separate onto the liquid portion and the solid portion. The liquid portion is called a serian, which means white blood cell, red blood cell, and platinum and the clotting factors removed. Usually the serine is rich in micro, rich in antibody. We call it anti serine Now, serological testing, we could be testing uh, the interaction between antibody and the antigen. The example is agglutination, the fluorescence antibody technology. So first of all, you need to know, we could test him a microorganism using immunology methods, which is you have a 0157 antigen or H antigen. Then you have E. coli 0157 H7 bacteria. You can be mix them in a color sheet and then they could cause clumping. And this is an example of agglutination. Usually we call it a latex agglutination test. The company called Remo is have a very good tool. So you can see these A1 and 2 showing you very strong, which is glutination cross link between antibody antigen showing in this sheet, which means that sample is E. coli 0157H7 positive. Now here, which is showing you how we generate an antibody in the blood cell. So first of all, usually this, this one, this experiment did in a rabbit. So let's say we injected a rabbit with an attenuated, heat-treated staphylococcus aureus, usually in the ear, okay? Then we may get some of the antibody in the bloodstream. And then we're gonna do a serial dilution. And then when we get those antibody, we're gonna to in inoculate it with Staphylococcus aureus, which is an antigen. And then we're going to see which one is the first one created a hemoglobulization, which means the antibody could be to damage the blood cell. So here what we find, the one divided by 160 tube, which is the first one, created a hemoglobulization. That's why we call it a titer is 160. That's a reciprocal number of the dilution. 
Then this one, we could get it, we purified it, could generate an anti-staphylococcus aureus antibody in the blood cell, in the bloodstream, can be used for the treatment. But I want to tell you one thing, this process is very difficult to get because sometimes it depends on rabbit, it depends on uh, the experimental animals. Sometimes the animals will not have that strong immune response. They do not generate antibody. And sometimes that does, the, the inoculated staphylococcus aureus is very difficult to control. Lots of the time, if it's too low dose, you're not gonna have an immune response. If it's too high dose, the, the rabbits will be dying. So I just wanna tell you when in this process, it takes longer time. That's why antibody treatment, same thing for virus. It's even more difficult for virus. Antivirus, antibody treatment, even for coronavirus, it works very well, very efficiently, but it's very expensive because the process to create antibody takes very, very long time. Sometimes even half a year or like one year to generate the purified antibody. So that's why it's effective, but it's expensive. Oh, okay, so that's related to the coronavirus. That's what I want to mention a little bit here. So at the end of here, we're gonna finish this section. Uh, we have one more section has not been talking about, we will be talking about the virus. So we have a last section, uh, lecture five for the final exam we'll be talk tomorrow. Okay, thank you.